Hello, I'm Lauren Maturo, Director of Publicity at Blackstone Publishing, and I'm here today with my colleague Sam Benson, publicist at Blackstone. We are delighted to welcome you to our virtual chat with two fantastic novelists, Nick Jones, author of The Shadows of London, which is newly out this week, and Nick Parag, author of Jungle Up, which has recently released as well. Nick Jones and Nick Parag, we're thrilled to have you here to talk about your new books. Uh, for those watching, if you comment or ask a question during this event, you'll be entered to win a signed giveaway copy of Jungle Up and The Shadows of London. Let's get started by introducing the authors. Sam, over to you to introduce Nick Jones. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce Nick Jones, the author of the newly released book, The Shadows of London, part of the Joseph Bridgman series. Nick Jones was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire, and now lives in the Cotswolds, England. In a previous life, he ran his own media company and was a second Dan black belt in karate. These days, he can be found in his writing room, working on his latest mind-bending ideas, surrounded by notes and scribbling on a large whiteboard. He loves movies, kindness, gin, and vinyl. Blackstone published the first novel in the series, and then she vanished in February of this year. And this week, we are releasing the second novel in the series, The Shadows of London, this time bringing the main character, Joe, back to 1960s London, where he comes face to face with a ruthless gangster and witnesses the brutal murder of an innocent woman. And I'll be introducing Nick Parag. He's the author of Jungle Up and the best-selling author, author of the Thomas Prescott series, the 3 a.m. series, and The Speed of Souls. A Colorado native, he now lives in South Lake Tahoe with his two pups, Potter and Penny, Jungle Up is the fifth book in the Thomas Prescott series, and Booklist called it a stunner of a novel, winding up a series of tense situations and exploding them in scenes of shock and surprise. Each time you think you've reached the core of things, the rug is pulled from under you. In Jungle Up, Thomas Prescott journeys deep into the Bolivian Amazon to rescue Dr. Gina Brady, the woman who broke his heart, but still makes it beat furiously, who has been kidnapped. And today, we have with us a special surprise guest from Jungle Up, Camilla the Sloth, who <laughs> plays a key role in the book. Let's get into, here, can you see Camilla? <laughs> She's here, there we go. Let's get there into some is. questions for Nick, for Nick Jones and Nick Frog. Sam, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, so this first question is one for both of you. Um, so do you plot your stories in advance or do you kind of let them unfold naturally as you write? Go ahead, Nick Jones. <laughs> Shall I go first? Thanks, Nick Parag. We're going to be doing that all the time. It, it is like we're at school, isn't it? Uh, so, so in terms of plotting the book, so uh, very much so, yeah. So I plot well, well in advance. I didn't used to when I first started writing. I was a pantster, so for... For those who don't know, there's kind of pretty much two camps of writers. You've got the the people who just make it up as they go along. They start the novel and they just uh, they keep going until they write the end. Uh, and I kind of envy those guys. But no, I'm definitely a, a planner. So, but that has changed quite considerably over the course of my career so far. So I'm sort of on my sixth book now, and uh, it's definitely more of a planning process for me. So. I think especially if you're writing into a series as well, perhaps if I was writing a, uh, the next time I go, I, I, you know, I write a standalone, I might approach it slightly differently. But I think if you're writing to a, a series, you really need to know kind of where you're going. So uh, for me, it's, uh, yeah, it's planning all, all of the way. Uh, same, same for me. I, I outline extensively each book. I don't know how these authors that, <laughs> like Joan said, fly by the seat of their pants, do it with a mystery because there's so much plotting with red herrings and you really got to know what direction you're going or you can get lost. And uh, even outlining as extensively as I do, you know, I still get lost from time to time. But obviously it's flexible, you know, I'll outline the big picture and then I'll outline each chapter, but, you know, they're obviously going to change over time so you got to be pretty flexible with it and uh yeah but i'd say for every hour that i write i'd probably spend an hour plotting and outlining so one to one in that regard for me i'm, I'm more like five to one i think yeah <laughs> spend, 
most of my time is planning and the writing it kind of feels almost like it's almost like uh the writing is like taking the easy a part well in a way it's like it's the final step for me which has definitely changed over the years but i've kind of gone from the planning feels like I've done it sort of detailed, well, almost like a pencil sketch. And then the writing is actually like the oil painting, you know, it becomes like this thing at the end. But th without the sketch, it was kind of nothing. And I think the sketch is what takes me the most time, I think. The yeah. writing is almost, yeah, it's the final step, it feels like these days, which I know for some people, they can say that might take the sting out of the, the kind of excitement or the creativity. But I, I think like you were just saying, Nick, it it's I try and leave enough room so that there's still that spark and I try and remember the spark that I had when I was planning so when you have that idea if you get an idea that I kind of have like the prickle test if my arms kind of prickle up then that was a good idea and I try and remember that feeling to make sure that I don't just throw that scene out the window because I'm bored with it you know right so like the the book that I'm writing right now I gave it a couple months to breathe and I came up with an even big, better, bigger twist than I had before. Nice. So I had to go back, you know, re-outline everything. So you have to be flexible with it. And when you do get those, that epiphany, which you know is just magical, it's the best part of the process for me, for sure. Mm. And then, yeah, just executing it, hoping it translates from how you've outlined it, how, you, how you've ran the movie in your head to the, to the page. We've got a couple of comments here um, from Catherine. She says, hi, I listen to the audiobooks by Nick. Love, 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 love your books. I do a lot of traveling and kept very entertained. Just finished the Thomas Prescott series. Um, Michelle Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Love that. Michelle Kelly says, Nick, absolutely love Jungle Up. How is Lassie's future looking? So Lassie is a character in my 3 a.m. series. So um, he'll be back in a couple years, but uh, I gotta, I'm writing two more Thomas Prescott books before I can get back to the 3 a.m. series, but we'll, we'll get back to Lassie at some point. Um, Catherine asks, where do you get your ideas for your books? Asking both authors. So, or do you want to go? I'll, uh, I'll take this one. Go for it. <laughs> First. Uh, so for me, it's, it's primarily stuff that I'm interested in. So there'll be something that I'm either, if I'm reading another book or watching a TV show or um, reading an article or something in the news that sparks, you know, an interest in me to look further into it. So you know, for one of my books that had a lot to do with uh, Monsanto and GMOs and big biotech. And so I just threw myself into researching that. I knew I wanted to turn that into a uh, cold case mystery. And then, yeah, just for me, it's something that I come across that sort of, you almost get that audible ping. You're like, you know, there's something here. This is an interesting subject matter. I have to explore this. I, I wanna, I wanna create a story with this. So, that's my story. <laughs> and how do you cap? Sorry, I've got a question for you now, Nick. Just out of interest, how do you kind of capture those ideas? Are you constantly kind of making notes and stuff like that, and making sure you don't they don't slip through your fingers? Or yeah, so once I I do everything in Google Drive. I don't know how you do things, but uh, so once I get an idea. I'll create a document in Google Drive, outline what I have and, and throw it in a folder. Yeah, mm. but it usually takes, you know, it's more than just that, that single idea. Usually it takes like a culmination of two or three different things that come together and then you've got yourself a story. So, you know, some of these things you get pinged, you know, three years ago and then you get pinged two years ago and then you get pinged a week ago and then you have your story so it's it's not like one it's just it's weird it's different every time which mm -hmm. is cool each each book is its own triathlon and you uh you don't really know the rules until you you start running no i agree i definitely have ideas or things that 
have really appealed to me and I've uh, but I haven't quite known what to do with it. I've just kind of thought that's important. I don't know why yet. And then it might be like, you, as you described it, it's almost like a, a boomerang. You know, you kind of you reach out and you catch it a few years later and go, that's why I needed that, because that's going to work so well over here. So I, it almost feels like there's something we're going on that, there's, you know, your subconscious is kind of busy potentially while you're wondering what the hell is going on. But I think I'm the same as you, really, in terms of, you know, I can see a few more people in the chat asking where do the ideas come from? I remember Stephen King being asked that and he said, I don't know. And if I did, do you think I'd tell you? <laughs> Which I thought was great. But uh, I think I mean, the ideas definitely come from other places. And I think you have to keep I think of it as keeping the inkwell uh, full. So I like to try and fill the inkwell as often as I can in terms of. And for me, that's usually film. Uh, I love film and particularly TV at the moment when you're writing a, in, a, in a series to see how the, uh, at the moment good uh, script writers are taking a simple, like, you know, core ideas and a set of characters and expanding those over multiple seasons of very engaging television. I think that's such a, a gift for uh, us authors. And I kind of see it. Um, you know, that's my hobby anyway. You know, I'm going to be watching films. I'm going to be reading books. I'm going to be doing all these things anyway. But I also have a different lens where I'm looking at it, uh, you know, as an author. And that's, you know, that that is sort of homework. Um, and I liken it to kind of, I think of them as story engines. So it might be sat in the chassis of a particular car and that might be the genre. So it, you might be watching, I don't know, comedy and that there'll be an entire story engine that's being, con you know, contained within that chassis but I try and come and zoom right out and actually take that entire engine and put it into a different chassis and see if it works. So I'm always kind of making notes about why certain things have worked. So you're, you're hugely entertained. An entire episode of a TV show or a film just really hit all the, all the buttons. I'll just analyze the hell out of that to understand why it worked so well. Uh, and then I'll try and come up with a sort of very simple way of remembering that so that if i'm struggling with a scene i might kind of think i wonder if i could do something similar to when you know and you could be working on a dramatic scene and remember something from rick and morty i mean it could be absolutely anything that just sparks you off and you think that really worked well so i think i think the answer there's the sort of that's a long answer to a short uh, question which is what i think ideas really are absolutely everywhere and I, similar to nick i i capture them uh anywhere i can and make sure i've always got them to hand I, I remember reading that exact quote from Stephen King. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. Well, it's, it's creativity is one of the things that science hasn't figured out. It's, it's, there's something truly magical about creativity and just, you know, this, this well that you tap into and yeah, there in every single one of my books, there's always been this magical moment that's sort of beyond explanation that, uh, it's kind of very cool. <laughs> yeah, Bigger than you, have you. To yeah. you have to sort of trust that feeling, don't you, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there have been a few for me. I mean, I, on the on the first book in the series, actually, and then she vanished. I got two thirds of the way through before I actually knew the ending on that one. And when I did, it was like a lightning bolt. I mean, it, it nearly knocked me off my feet. It was so strong that I suddenly I, I felt like I caught up with whatever my muse or subconscious or whatever you want to call it, whatever that knew, I kind of caught up and went, oh my God, yes, thank you. You know, it literally, it felt like that. It was very surreal, very strange. But yeah, I think it's tapping into something bigger than us, maybe. Yeah, I'll just, that that lightning bolt you felt definitely comes across on the page because I felt it when I read the ending. It was- Oh, nice, thank you. It was good. It was cool. awesome. Well, there's so much love for both of you in the comments, um, but Sarah Potter asks, who are your favorite authors? Question for both of you. So the authors that shape my writing style are probably, you know, too many to count, but the, the biggest three that I, that I always say are uh, Nelson DeMille, who is a, he writes a detective, a few different series that are character driven first person narratives and I just fell in love with you know that internal dialogue and uh sort of the snarky sarcastic detective 
genre. Um, Janet Ivanovich, her Stephanie Plum series, just, you know, she has, she'll make you laugh just to make you, she'll go out of her way to have her character do something silly just to give you some enjoyment. And I've definitely kept that in my, um, in my repertoire. And then uh, Michael Crichton was big for me just cause, you know, he's pretty much hard sci-fi, but he was accepted as just this mainstream author. And uh, so those were the ones that I guess I'm, those were the authors that shaped my style the most. My favorite authors right now, the best book I've read in five years was Andy Weir's new, new novel, Project Hail Mary. So uh, it was just absolutely such a fun story to, to read. And it's going to be such a great movie with Ryan Gosling. So excited for that. <laughs> and, uh, but um, yeah. And then, but I do put the Harry Potter series on a pedestal by my favorite thing of all time. Just the universe that she created is just, you know, absolutely mind blowing. So, uh, all right, I'll pass this, I'll pass the baton, the virtual baton. Thank you. So, <laughs> I think from, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't really, you have to mention JK Rowling, don't you? I mean, I think, again, from a series perspective, it's just so inspiring uh, to, to have been able to achieve that. And that's definitely something I've kind of aspired to. I've already mentioned Stephen King. I think without him, I wouldn't be writing at all. So. I think a lot of people kind of presume maybe wrongly that he's just the horror guy. And I think when you kind of mention, oh, you know, well, you know, he wrote Shawshank Redemption, right? And they kind of go, did he? And you say, yeah, and you know, Stand By Me, you know, uh, did he? And then you keep reeling them off and people are going to go, oh, wow, and the Green Mile as well, really? You know, you sort of get all that kind of thing going on. So, yeah, I think Stephen King for me um, just always felt that, you know, he was, uh, I, I don't know, just his style of writing impacted me hugely. I think Hugh Howey, he wrote the Wool series and he started out as an indie publisher, which is the same as me. You know, he inspired me to basically just publish a book, even though I was really scared um, and, you know, really didn't know what I was doing. But he inspired me that it's OK just to get stuff out there. And then one thing sort of leads to another. So I'd have to mention him. Uh, John Grisham, I loved, I just love John Grisham, just the way that that guy structures a story is superb. Um, and I think also Jim Butcher, so I like a bit of urban fantasy as well, so the sort of Dresden Files, I, uh, again, I think I picked up quite a lot of the kind of, the fun kind of, I think one of the things he does very well with the Dresden Files is that he is able to tell an incredibly com complex world building story in first person, and that kind of inspired me to try and tell Joseph Bridgman's story in first person, even though I knew that was going to be difficult. I really wanted it to feel close and quite personal. I wanted to feel like it, almost like a diary. So I think it really kind of inspired me on that. And then I think finally I'd have to mention, no, I think I've mentioned everyone. Oh yeah, Andy Weir, because of The Martian. I think when I read The Martian, I was just about to start and then she vanished. And I think that that just, again, from a structure perspective, just kind of blew me away that he was able to he, he, able to have fun, actually, to tell a really serious story about Robinson Crusoe on Mars. But and yet be able to have so much fun with it. Uh, that just inspired me to kind of uh, almost not, you know, yes, I wanted to tell uh, a, a dramatic story, but I, I wasn't afraid to have a bit of comedy in there and a bit of a bit of fun. Uh, and that was very, very inspiring. So, yeah, I guess the list goes on. But, yeah, uh, probably the top, top, top for me would be Stephen King. And how do you guys balance um, the great humor with keeping the suspense going and the edge of your seat, you know, thriller? Like, how do you make that negotiate that balance so well? So it's actually a struggle for me because I think I'm hilarious. So, you are. <laughs> so I end up, you should see the stuff that I have to cut out of these books. You know, it's, uh, so it's really important to keep the humor organic. So, you know, the majority of the humor in my books comes from Thomas Prescott and just his reactions to certain events and, you know, certain people, he gets annoyed very easily. And, uh, 
you know, most of the humor is in his head, his internal dialogue that we all have when we're walking down the street, when we're at Walmart, when we're, you know, going about our daily lives. So, uh, but it, it's definitely, you know, you put, I put Thomas in these situations and then we have the same, I'm not Thomas Prescott because he's tough and I'm definitely more of a weenie, but <laughs> we have the same sense of humor, the same sensibilities and the same internal dialogue. So like I'm putting Thomas in the jungle, which is so scary for me thinking about being in a jungle and having him react. And uh, yeah, you just have to make, if you look at my first book, which I wrote when I was 22, the ratio of humor to story is probably a little out of whack. It probably leans too far towards humor. Like I'm going out of my way. It, it, it's, it's less organic. And as I've matured as a writer, I've really been more careful and more cognizant of just making sure the humor doesn't take the reader out of the story. I mean, I'm still gonna have silly situations and have tons of silly stuff, but I want it to keep the story moving forward as opposed to like family guy, like throwaway snippet that has nothing to do with like the main show, which I've done before. So, but, you know, long winded answer. I love when people love my stories, but when I get comments that I've made people laugh, like, you know, some lady, I'm listening to your book on my train and I'm laughing out loud and people are staring at me like I'm crazy. That just like fills me with like hot cocoa belly. It's like, <laughs> it's the best, it's the best part. <laughs> and how about you, Nick Jones? How do you balance the humor and the action and plot? Sounds really similar. I think, I think it's the situations that uh you know the situations you put characters into how they respond can you know that's where the comedy is going to come from really so i think for me you know i started out when i was writing time travel uh it's really great to, to imagine time travel and just sort of think wow wouldn't it be cool to like go back to 1960s london and go to carnaby street and see all this really cool stuff but i would uh, it would be horrendous it would be so scary and i'd be absolutely petrified about changing anything and doing all these sort of things so for me, I kind of think I just wanted to be honest about that. And I think I think if you're honest, it, it is funny because it's quite disarming. And I think for me, you know, Joseph as a character, he is not heroic. You know, he's, he spends the most of the first book, uh, you know, petrified about what what he might what he might do. And but that I think so I think the comedy kind of comes from yeah, it's it's honesty in situations. I don't try and find it. And, and, and in fact, I think the comedy should sort of land because of the, yeah, it's the reactions to what's happening to them, if they're, if they're that kind of character. But like Nick was saying, I, you know, life is such a tapestry of emotions, isn't it? You know, you've got kind of, I want books to be a, a dramatic sort of emotional landscape and comedy is part of that. I think that because that's part of life, you know, if at some point in your life you're not laughing, there's definitely something wrong you're also going to be crying. You're also going to be heartbroken. You're also going to be ecstatic. That's, I try and pack all that into fiction and comedy is just a part of that because that's how I live my life. You know, I want, I, I try and, you, you shouldn't try to have a laugh. You're just going to have it. So to me that I, I don't want to write books that don't have a bit of fun in them. So that's definitely part of my DNA. I think as a writer is to, is to want to, I love hearing that I, I made people laugh like exactly like Nick said, you know, if someone says, Oh, I, I almost spat out my tea when I was reading that book. But I also, they say, and then at the end, I was in tears. And I think, well, tick, you know, job done as an author, then I've given you an experience, you know, an emotional experience. So for me, that's important. Great. Um, we have another audience question. So PJ Jones asks, did you find the lockdown time this past year to be productive for you? Or were you concerned, too concerned, stressed to be writing? It was brutal. <laughs> like You would think the lockdown would have been a writer's dream. And, you know, in so many ways, 
so lucky because financially, you know, it, it, I wasn't impacted very hard financially. You know, I, I work from home already. So in some ways being a writer is very, uh, pandemic proof. I don't know if that's a, a good term, but I really struggled with writing mostly because my office would be a Starbucks or a Whole Foods where I could get out of the house, go write for three hours, you know, write my, you know, eight to 10 pages and then come home. Being, you know, quarantined, not being able to get out of the house, I just found it really hard to get motivated to get anything done. And uh, yeah, so for me, it was, I struggled for sure. Yeah, similar for me as well. I think the, uh, you know, I'd already been working at home for quite a few years anyway. So I felt like I had a head start on a lot of my friends who were kind of like, oh my God, I'm still in my pajamas. It's two o'clock. And I'm like, me too, just get used to it. It's fine. <laughs> you know, so I think uh, I, I was kind of used to that already, I suppose. But what was happening in the world was obviously, you know, weighing heavy on everyone. So, you know, I had that kind of emotional, I suppose, uh, stress. But there was... Um, you know, we are lucky, I think, as, as writers, people who can actually work from home. So for me, the sort of solitude and just cracking on with a day job was something I was doing anyway. And I had a hell of a lot to do that I'd already planned out. So I just kind of hit it really and just got on with it. There were no distractions in some ways, whilst there's no silver linings when it comes to the pandemic. It was like in some ways that was a good thing. I could just get my head down, get on with it. There were no there were literally no excuses. It was just like, well, I might as well do some writing. Um, so, you know, it was very, very productive for me. Um, but it's, I think I'm really feeling it now. For, uh, for so long, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I can just crack on with work and I don't need to do much really. I can just stay at home and just write, I'm happy. But I think you, as time goes along, you realize actually I really miss friends. I really miss people. And it's actually, it's the stuff that you do outside of the day job that's so important. All that socializing stuff that we do. I've, I've, I've got it in a new I've put that in a new light, really, and just made sure that as we come out of the pandemic that, you know, I'm going to make sure I prioritize some of that stuff. And just I think like all of us just value that a bit more. But no, it was actually very productive for me. So, yeah, some good writing done. So I'm I'm very introverted. I'm a homebody. I mean, you would think I was in quarantine before the pandemic the way <laughs> that I live my life. So but I like that energy. I like being around that energy, but sort of invisible. And that's when I like to write. I like to write in a coffee shop that's busy with all these ambient noises and conversations going around me. I love that energy. Not necessarily a part of it, but um, yeah, that's when I, I just do my best writing. So, um, you know, the only, phys <laughs> the only person that touched me in the last 15 months was my chiropractor. So... <laughs> It's been a very sad, <laughs> it's been a very sad 15 months, but um, yeah, uh, things are starting, you know, you can sort of see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and where I live in South Lake Tahoe, I mean, Memorial Day weekend was crazy here, tons of tourists, lots of energy, so um, where Nick was very, <laughs> got a lot of done, got a lot of stuff done, um, now I'm playing catch up. We've got a lot of questions here. Um, here's another one. What are the main differences between writing a standalone book versus writing a series? Kay Renfrew asks, and that's for both Nicks. Go ahead, Jonesy. Okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think massively different because I think uh, when you're writing the first book, it feels like a standalone. Um, so that's like, that's the same. But I think once you, once you know, I mean, I knew pretty much after I'd written, I always sort of write the, the prologue to a book and see whether I like it, see whether it's going to, going to work for me, whether I want to carry on with that character. So I'd written the prologue uh, and I thought, yeah, I want, uh, this is going to be a series. This is a character who, is only going to get so far in book one and has got so much further to go. But you have to obviously uh, also deliver 
a really good self-contained story that if that's all anybody read, you know, if they only read the first book and said, yeah, you know, I loved it, but I'm not into series for whatever reason, you know, you'd want that to be satisfying and a good standalone novel. But I knew that I wanted it to be a series. So I think it, writing a series is a bit like time travel. You have to l exist in the present, the past and the future, because I'm always looking back at what I've done. I'm thinking about what the character's doing in this particular book, but I'm also now looking ahead. You know, I, the, the series that I have planned out is seven books because Harry Potter, but mm -hmm. not just because Harry Potter, but you know, you know, but the series mostly, is, but mostly, mostly Harry Potter. Harry yeah. Uh, but you know, that, that I've decided that I don't want it to be, I don't want to flesh it out too much. I don't want to kind of pad the series out. I've got enough story to really pack in, uh, to pack into seven books. So, I want it to be seven books. Um, and from, you know, from my perspective, I'm, as I'm writing, I'm just finished book three. I'm currently writing uh, in the planning phase of book four. I'm also planning books five, six, and seven partially at the same time, because that's a lot to do with pacing. So it, it just makes it really complicated. And, and honestly, there's not a lot of help out there in terms of, you know, there's, there's loads of books on how to write, but not that many about a series. So I, I I'm having to do a lot of study at the same time. So I think it, I think it is massively different. You know, if you, if you set out to write a, st a standalone novel, uh, that, that almost feels like a treat at the moment. The idea of just writing one, but uh, I'm not complaining at all, but it's uh, yeah, it's more, it's just more complicated. There's just a lot more balls to keep up in the air while you're juggling. Yeah, I, I concur. I mean, as, a standalone is self-contained, so there's nothing to compare it to. You're not comparing book one to book four, book two to big, book five. Um, so for me, I came up, I've been writing the Thomas Prescott series for 18 years. So I came up with the character my senior year in college, you know, 18 years ago. And so in that first book, he's 32 years old. And now in Jungle Up, he's 30 seven years old so he's only aged five years whereas i've gone from a kid to a slightly older kid but i've matured profoundly over 18 years so um the biggest struggle with the series is con continuity you have to make sure that your characters are seamless throughout so you know thomas does mature over the course of five years but you want to make sure it's not the leaps and bounds that I've, that I've matured over 18 years. So even with jungle up, I had to go back in and make him more of a prick <laughs> and more sarcastic and more, um, you know, more in line with who he is in the first four books you know, who isn't necessarily how I'd react to situations now as a 40 year old with, with two old dogs. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and just, you know, the continuity of the story where the book I'm working right now is book six in the series, but it's actually gonna be the origin story of Thomas Prescott. So making sure everything in this book that I'm writing right now jives with everything later on in the series as well as when I wrote Jungle Up I have to make sure that everything that Thomas Prescott's experienced in the 1500 pages that I've already written with him translates into who he is in book five and so when you step away from that because there's been there's been times when I've taken I write another series where I've taken three years away from Thomas Prescott and then when you get back into it, you know, I've had to read my books. <laughs> you know, there's nothing worse than rereading your books as homework. Like, oh, I remember this. I got to remember this. He did this. He did this. So, I mean, sometimes it's fun because when you're so far removed from it, it's like someone else wrote it. And you can cringe at some of the writing and then you can, you know, hip, hip, hooray at some of the writing and you make yourself laugh and but um yeah i'd say a series is much harder just for the continuity aspect and like he said you know he's outlining he's working on book four but you always have to have future books 
you know, you have to have that file open in your brain. And, uh, yep. <laughs> Great. Well, one more audience question um, from Cheryl Folk. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Was there a defining moment? And this is for both of you. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, uh, it was actually really quite late on. I mean, I, I basically, uh, there was a brilliant uh, thing that Tony Robbins said. It was He talked about, um, if you want to know what you're supposed to be doing with your life, what were you doing when you were age seven? And uh, I was definitely, you know, I was I was playing with my action figures and I was making up stories. I mean, entire character arcs, you know, they, these, these things would go on all day. I was just quite happy if I was just playing with my toys, making up stories. So I guess the clues were always there. Uh, then I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, um, I got into sort of drama and acting and I wanted to be a playwright and then that didn't quite stick. And then I thought, actually, I, I kind of think I want to be like a famous rock star or something so i got into bands and i was writing lyrics and i was so i was always searching in what i think of as kind of shadow careers so they were kind of almost there they were kind of similar but not quite right um and then i then i thought okay well i love film so i'm going to write a, a film script um so i began writing a film script and then as i began to fill in the prose in between the dialogue i said oh it's looks like it's a book then so it kind of started to expand into actually being a novel. So it kind of crept up on me. I don't think there was a moment where I thought, I want to do this. There were plenty of moments where I thought I can't do this. And there were plenty of moments where I thought I'm terrible at this, but it never kind of quite smacked me in the mouth until I wrote the first chapter of, um, and then she vanished. I think as soon as I found Joseph Bridgman and I wrote the first chapter of that book, and I had so much fun just writing that, that I thought, Ah, okay, fun. Yeah, I could probably, if I'm having fun, then I'm probably doing the right job. So uh, that's when it hit me. So it's actually in my, in terms of my life, pretty pretty late on to realize that that's what I wanted to be doing. I wish I could time travel back and smack myself in the face and say, for God's sake, write books, you idiot. Um, for me, it was, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was like 12 years old. I was convinced that I was going to be in the NBA because basketball was my life. And then I was, I started high school. I was four eleven, and then I didn't get that two foot growth spurt. So I had to sort of throw my dreams of being the next great NBA star away. And my life had always revolved around sports and reading. And so I just remember reading Matilda and just loving it and then rereading it. So I was already reading books differently when I was really young. Um, almost, they call it actively reading. Like, why do I wanna turn the page? Why does the author have me so sucked in that like, I can't go to bed. I have to read for four hours straight and not go to the bathroom. And so it was just always one of those things. I was gonna be a writer which is risky because in a lot of regards, it's, it's so cool because, you know, you're, you're in college and you're with friends that don't know what they want to do. And they're just sort of up in the air with, you know, trying to find or let their vocation, let their passion find them. Whereas my passion found me when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old, but all your eggs is, are in one basket. I mean, it was become the next great novelist or die trying. So um, yeah, for me, it was just, it always was. It's hard to explain in creativity because, you know, it finds you. So, you know, it was hunting down Jonesy for a while and then it tackled him. Yeah, big time. I think for me, it was like, it felt like there were there were so many it was very strange there were so many messages that felt like the universe was saying well if you're not going to do it now when is it actually going to be because we we are nudging you you know left right and center you know we've turned your we we you know we've turned all of these cogs in your life it's now or never kind of thing so yeah it was definitely definitely a calling isn't it yeah for sure and you you got to do it even if uh, you just have to give it a go 
Well, we're almost at time, um, but we have a final question to ask you both. Um, Nick Jones, can you give us a teaser of what's next for Joseph Bridgman? And Nick Parag, can you give us any hints about what's on the horizon for Thomas Prescott and his next adventure? Start with you, Nick Jones. Okay, sure. So uh, obviously we've got book two has just been released. So that's got Joe heading back to 1960s London, uh, as you described, to sort of face up against some gangsters. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool adventure. Vinny, Vinny, his vinyl loving sidekick, kind of heads off to the 60s with him. So it's a fun book. It's lots of action, lots of adventure, pretty heartfelt stuff. Uh, like, like the first, if you like the first book, the second book's definitely going to be your bag. Uh, and then book three is coming out um, January. Uh, and book three sends Joe uh, not only into the future, but also back to Paris in 1873 to a opera house fire. So yeah, the stakes are higher. There's um, a missing time traveler. There's uh, it's a it's a really cool adventure. And he's got a, a, a sort of connections with the past and the future. So Joe has really got to step up. So I'm throwing him literally into the fire in book three. I'm so excited to read, like, I'm almost jealous. Writing a time travel series would be so much fun because you literally can go wherever you want. So I'm, I'm stoked. I'm, I'm super excited. Don't be jealous. It's absolute hell. <laughs> too, many, too many options. Oh, <laughs> just trying to keep, just keep, trying to keep a track on all the paradoxes. I mean, I get... Plenty of reviews from people saying, it, yeah, it's a, it's a good book apart from the paradoxes. And I'm like, you can't write a time travel book without the paradoxes. It's just impossible. All you can do is limit them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so for me, uh, so I'm writing Thomas Prescott's origin story right now. So it's going to take place about two years before the first book in the series. And uh, it's probably one of the best storylines that I've come up with. I don't want to jinx it, but um, so it takes place in 2011 during the whole Occupy Wall Street thing in, uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, <laughs> I won't get into it too much, but um, <laughs> I actually can't give it anything away. So <laughs> it's going to be great. It's an origin story. Thomas Prescott is 30 years old which has been a lot of fun because I have to make him even younger and more immature and more, um, you know, even more sarcastic and more just uh, spontaneously. Anyhow, it's, it's, it's going to be good. I'm excited. It should be out. Um, I just talked to my publisher and director yesterday and it should be out. Um, September of next year. So um, I still actually COVID, I thought before COVID, I had set up a trip to go to Philadelphia to research all these different settings and, you know, do my due diligence and then COVID hit. And then I thought maybe I could write the book just without going to visit there. Because it's a great time to be an author with Google Earth, you can walk the streets, you can sort of go to these places virtually and uh you can usually get enough where you can put the reader there but it's it's dawned on me in the last couple of weeks that I have to go to Philadelphia so I'm setting up a trip and it's going to be fun and I'm going to go visit all these places and it's going to make the book absolutely pop in next September so uh I will give you the title it's called The Numbers and it's awesome gonna be great wonderful well thank you both so much for the this wonderful event thank you everybody for tuning in for your great questions and comments uh, we hope you'll check out these two amazing new series the shadows of london and jungle up are available now in print ebook and audio wherever books are sold thanks again for tuning in thanks nick parag and nick jones thank you thanks, a lot. thanks everyone